Hi everyone, welcome to a new series of the Long Overdue podcast. Um, I'm starting a new series because the last few, I think they've all just been testers leading up to what I'm going to be doing now, which is talking to you know business leaders, creatives, um, leaders in, the own, in their own right around topics that explore masculinity and male mental health and uh, what that means for male issues and how we can kind of like go below the surface of just talking about toxic masculinity and you know how we allow men to cry and talk more because um, as great as those conversations are I think a lot of the time when people have them they just scratch the surface of what actually runs deeper in regard to um, talking about male issues and talking about male culture so I've recently, and in the first episode of the series that we're doing now, I've been talking to George, who runs an amazing account called The Tin Men. And that, ca- that account is basically created to educate people on male issues through statistics and insightful and beautiful and really inspiring conversations. And how George does it and curates his content is quite amazing. So I totally recommend that you go and follow the Tin Men. And you'll find us just picking up the conversation um, where George is just talking about, um, again, just an overview of what the Tin Men's about and how um, the topics that he explores all interconnect and intertwine with um, issues surrounding politics, sex, race, and all these issues that I've felt the world over, but how they just kind of intersect and marry with issues that relate to um, masculinity, male mental health, and just male issues as a whole. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoy having it. And please like, comment, and share, because the main priority of having all these conversations is that we talk about them more, and we create more positive platforms and you know conversations that we can have within the realm of social media and outside the realm of social media and so yeah you know just comment and share and let's create discussions like this more and more and hopefully well i'm not even hopefully i know we'll be back um in two weeks time where i'll have another conversation very similar to this one enjoy Uh, i try to occupy my own space um where i i sort of look at how mental health intersects with um, sort of politics and, you know, sexuality, race, uh, where you live, sort of finances, legal system. A lot of people try and pathologize mental health problems by seeing it as some sort of chemical Im- imbalance in your brain, something that's wrong inside of you. And um, using the biosocial model, which is what that's called. Um, whereas I try to look at mental health within the context of your lived experience within your um, environment, uh, your family, your upbringing. Uh, this is, I, 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 t- I worked a little bit with a male suicide researcher called Susie and she talks a lot about this. She, together we did the biggest, I, uh, together we did, I think the biggest study into male suicide ever, where I used her apparatus and her sort of surveying tools and her method- methodology. And then I used my following to get the, um, sort of uh, input of about, uh, I think it's like, I think it's like 10, like thousands of men, thousands and thousands of men wrote a survey about their experience of mental health and their childhood trauma. And um, Susie, the researcher, she, um, she was sort of reading people's stories and she was just like, holy shit, I'm not, su- I'm not surprised you don't want to be here anymore. Whereas people would look at male suicide as some sort of thing to be fixed with some sort of pharmacological interventions, which I'm, I'm all for, um, you know, taking drugs and stuff. But at the same time, we also need to look at the lived experience of people who are suffering mental health. And sometimes it's quite right that they are, they're feeling this way. Sometimes they've been through some horrific things. And, yeah. by, and by chalking up someone's mental health purely to chemical imbalances or psychological problems, rather than looking at it within the context of what's happened to them, we're not getting a full picture. So I try to provide the the political insight i try to look at like how does our, the way our legal system for example treats fathers and how it deprives fathers of their children in the uk routinely 
How does that impact some impact someone's health? How does our legislation around sexual violence and rape, which ex, which which um, excludes men from being victims of rape, how does that impact their mental health? How does homelessness yeah. impact? Them? How does drug addiction? How does how do these very real societal problems impact someone's mental health? And I, I hope that provides a, an interesting counterbalance to the wider men's mental health conversation, which is which is more focused around what we're doing, which is talking. And talking yeah. is an important part of that as well. I, I want to sort of talk about the things they're talking about. So if I ask someone to talk and they talk about they're losing their ch children in, in a divorce, I want to be like, well, yeah. why is that? Is that right? Is that fair? Are you being screwed over by it? So I, I'm trying to talk about the things that are impacting men a bit early down the path before they arrive at the um, moment of crisis. And I think like the like beauty of all the, the work and the research that, that you do in the kind of posts that you put out, because um, it, it, it paints a, a picture which I think is equally interesting in regard to how a lot of issues that do need to kind of be addressed are like systemic issues as well. And we hear a lot of like, how you know within um feminism you know there's systemic issues we need to look at but then equally there's like this new system of systemic issues that we need to look at for men's issues as well like i've i've always considered the tin men to be uh research and development basically how do i talk about these very controversial difficult to hear issues in a way that it's a balancing act between being understanding and welcoming of all voices but then also not uh, being unapologetic i used to start a lot of my posts i'll talk about male victims of abuse and i'd always have to dedicate the first slide or two to being like right so women are also abused da, 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 violence against women and i'd always have to offer a series of apologies for what i was about to say and now i've made a conscious choice not to do that and i, I feel like men should be able to have a, we should, have a, should we should be able to have a conversation in that instance about male victims of abuse in in its own right and yeah. um that doesn't mean I don't care about women. Of course I do. I might, I position my channel as adding to conversations rather than taking away or overlaying the issues that men experience on top of women. But I don't always, I also don't, don't claim to get it right every time. I try to present these arguments in a way that is welcoming and um, accepting and, and gender neutral. I want to write about them in a way that is fun, engaging, in, informative, uh, is, is sort of gender neutral in its visual approach, and then also asks questions. I also, if, if I had a, a slogan, it would be, what do you think? And that's how I end most of my, most of my posts end with that question. And yeah. this is what I, this is, these, this is information. This is how I feel. What do you think? And I guess that, that sort of summarizes the account. I want it to be a, a, an ongoing journey and learning experience where I invite other people, not just myself to, to lend their point of view. Like we're talking a lot on that today. We're talking about, um, sort of body image against men particularly around heights and how height makes you less desirable in dating and also it, it even impacts your salary it's something like if every inch you get paid 800 dollars less they found in america which is crazy so there's a lot of ongoing conversation about height and men of different height talking in the conversations about about that and it's very it's very interesting and um the best content i have is in the comments i find and uh I try, I try my best to make it inclusive as possible. At the same time, I feel like men should take up their space. I, I don't want to start every post of a series of apologies or giving penance to feminism. I feel yeah. like we, should, we can have our own conversation respectfully and, and not have to apologize for it. <clears throat> and I think it's great because I think I also heard you mention when you were talking to Susie about how you and her both utilize Reddit or utilize Reddit <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. I think, conduct the research as well. Which you, which, you, which you both did between you. And um, I yeah. find Reddit interesting. I, I'm on Reddit as well, and I get um, a lot of my information off there when I'm posing questions and trying to decipher how I approach a conversation. Um, because I find that the communities on there, that people really want to listen to you, and they really want to answer, and they really want to give their opinion. Whereas on other platforms like Instagram, I think it's equally great that you can open up those conversations, but it feels like there are a lot more people are more inclined to combat one another and kind of like create a polarization where on Reddit, um, it, it kind of offers up more of a, an, an interest and an insight as opposed to people just kind of wanting to fight 
over the questions? Can, yeah. I think Reddit is, has a slightly different structure to Instagram where it's divided into subreddits, as you know, which are sort of like little forums. So you have a, for, you have a subreddit about everything, literally everything. The one I'm most connected to is uh, Left Wing Male Advocates, which talks about men, but from a left a left leaning point of view, um, which I am. Uh, and naturally, you have a gathering of similarly minded people. Not always. You you do get a crazy troll every now and again. <laughs> Find their way into Reddit and start throwing you know throwing the toys around. But in Instagram, it's a bit of a disorganized mashup of <laughs> different voices and. Of course, I, I attract a certain kind of follower, but I don't think those boundaries are so definitive as they are on Reddit, which is probably why you get such a mix of different people. And I think that's great. I feel like I want to I want to I want to meet people that I don't agree with. I want to be able to speak to people whose cha- whose mind I want to change. And I think that's so important when it comes to speaking about these things, is showing people that you can have these conversations um as i say particularly from a world where things do feel polarized and people want to feel like they're on the right side of wrong a bit too much to the detriment of being able to have a conversation where you can be met with a different view and be okay with that and be willing to kind of listen and learn and also admit your wrongs when you can maybe met with an idea that does make you think, oh, okay, like that's new information. I didn't know yeah. that. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's why I began. I, I started from Reddit yeah. and I set up the Tin Men, not not of the intention of necessarily posting content. I just wanted an account that I could comment on other accounts, <laughs> like a sock puppet account of it originally. And I, I would comment a lot on feminist accounts, if I'm honest, and try and add like additional perspectives to things they're talking about. Not dissimilar to what I talk about now, but in the comments. And I was just like shouted down, like routinely told, go make your own page. This isn't for you. Go start your own conversation. And then eventually getting like blocked. I mean, I never, I, I was never rude or hostile. I was always approaching it in a way that was in good faith. But there's only so many times you can be told to go set up your own conversation before you actually do it, which is what I did. And now I'm here. I, I, I also, even before that, I was on Reddit. I remember my first interaction with the issues I speak about was when I was moving to London and I was denied uh, a, a flat to rent p- purely on the basis of my gender. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, apparently, for the, I remember it was like, I got an email back from the estate agent saying, for the safety and comfort, quote, of the landlady, she wants a female tenant. And I was like, fuck. And then... From that point on, I, that, that started me off. And I remember like posting about it on Reddit, being like, is this discrimination? <laughs> like, does it, feel, it feels like discrimination. But I'm, I've been told that men can't be discriminated against, but I mean, I, I can't really find a better word for it. And uh, from there, that was years ago, five or six years ago. And it is discrimination, and it routinely happens to men. They're often, especially black men, refused accommodation consistently. Uh, so that's where I started. And we, I think those feelings still occur now, though, in regard to discrimination and feeling discriminated against, where, as a guy, you do have a habit of questioning whether or not, like, is that something I, I, that, that could warrant me to be upset about or should I be annoyed about, particularly within the conversations um, around... Um, when you know women are talking more about um, feeling safer walking along the streets, and men are being portray- portrayed as um, you know predators, and you know this kind of almost like a feared uh, gender. And I remember seeing conversations pop up where men were clearly angered, but it almost felt hard to admit that you felt angry about how you were being portrayed to the point that you were then questioning can I talk about this? You know, I have a right to talk about it. And it's weird that you have to stop yourself because you feel like, oh, I, I might cause a, a stir. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a shame that, you know, you, you do put a, put a stopper on having certain conversations. I, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have these conversations in real life. I only have them behind the guise of the red, the red dot, which is my sort of um, logo. Of the Tin Men, like I, I, I try to have these conversations in pubs, but 
people find them so uncomfortable. People start like getting so angry. And I'm like, I don't understand why it's so deserving of contempt just to talk about these things. Everyone's like, oh, men's rights. And I'm like, just call them human rights. And mm -hmm. suddenly we all give a shit about them. Like, you, knew, you used, is it fair? You said, is it fair to get annoyed for being discriminated against as a man? And as anyone that thinks, disagrees with that, I suggest you go down to your local family court and watch the dads coming out of the secret courts without the children, losing custody in a, in a system that is corrupt and watching them. Is that, are they annoyed? I think annoyed is the least they, they are going to be. I think heartbroken, devastated. Uh, I think they, they, I think they're, we're not talking about inconveniences here. People say like sexism against men is just an, an inconvenience. And it's like, it's not an inconvenience. It's, it, can, it can quite literally be a matter of life and death. Like it's, to go tell the, the one in three victims of abuse in the UK, you, there's nowhere for you to go. There is not a single refuge for you to seek help. Go tell that man he's inconvenienced. Like he, and, or ask him if he's annoyed. And um, again, like we talked about education, like we talk about the boys in the, in this in the UK in the entire Western world. I would argue are being discriminated against in the education system because the education system is set up m mainly by women to help um, to help girls in, in a very specific type of learning that is beneficial to girls and has been shown to be less effective on against boys. There's even arguments that boys should start school later because the because of their circadian rhythm. There's arguments that boys should start a year later because they mature slower. There's arguments that they prefer more physical styles of spatial learning rather than uh, sort of reading textbooks. And if you consider the fact that 80% of teachers are women, it's not surprising that this system is set up for the learning of women. Uh, and, and then you can see it comes out, it comes out in, in um, the data because boys are behind in school. Boys are behind in every stage of school in the entire West, every country in the Western world, boys are behind in, in education. In the UK, they're behind at every stage of education, every single stage from early learning, SATs, GCSEs, A-levels, and university, postgrad, boys are behind. And they've been behind for as long as I've been alive, which is more than 30 years. And I was just like, find me a better word than discrimination for that. And I'll, I'll start using that one instead. Uh, and I feel like that's something to be annoyed about. We wouldn't accept that in any other group. And we shouldn't accept it for our boys. And I think we've, we've on all these, because there's so many interesting issues to be explored and to understand. And I think just kind of going back to Reddit, I've kind of realised that it feels like there's almost this need uh, for men to find these communities where they can go to in order to kind of voice their concerns. And I know sometimes people can feel as though that if men are just kind of getting together in one room, they're going to become some form of an incel culture where <laughs> men are just talking to men. But yeah. it's not the case. I think, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm seeing it where that there is this need for men to have their own spaces where they can talk with other men who understand the pain that they go through as a man um, within the situation that they're, they're struggling with. Susie, in the podcast, she talks about like a tap where inside this tap, you have this pressure growing um, from various societal issues. And then for men, the tap is harder to open because they, they haven't been given those skills or the encouragement in childhood as much as women to um, speak about their problems. And uh, they, they also, that becomes a cyclic, um, cyclical effect because, because they don't talk about them, we don't hear them. And because we don't hear about them as a society, we don't change anything. So it goes round and round and round and um, it ends up in an epidemic of male suicide, which is the, what we're currently living through. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, and as, as for these male groups, like I also should also say that women are extremely active in these in these spaces as well. Like women are a huge ally to me, like over a quarter of my followers are women. So that's 10,000 women or more. Like the majority of my guests on, pod, on the podcast have been women. You mentioned Susie, who single-handedly did the biggest study on male suicide ever. I also interviewed Erin Pizzi, who, who set up the first refuge in the world for women and tried to do the same for men. Like women have been on the front lines to help men. Um, and I, I really, really hate hate and reject it when people accuse me of wanting to divide men and women because I'm like, no, I, women are my role models and heroes and, and friends. 
and uh, yeah, we need them. Like, I feel like women are so good. One thing we can all agree on, including about feminism, like they're so good at campaigning. Women, women love campaigning. They love make, setting up groups. They love supporting each other. They love making placards and getting in people's faces. They love, they love a bloody march. Like, if you've ever been to a women's march, which I, I have been to, it's like great fun. And uh, they're just better at it for whatever reason. Uh, they're just great campaigners and they get things done. I feel like men are more divided. Men are more like individual islands, which isn't good for campaigning. Um, so there's something we can learn from women. And I, I, I learn every day from women and uh, they're my greatest role models. And I, I think there's a, a, a front row seat for them in, in this journey that we're all on. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, I was um, pretty much brought up in a house of women, <laughs> my oh, mom yeah. and my two sisters. Yeah, yeah. And I think on that when you were talking to Susie when I was listening to that podcast earlier that you were talking about how there was like a, a, a need for, you know, men need, you know, um, father figures in their lives, a, a man to look up to right. as they kind of grow to help them as a, as a young boy growing into adulthood. But then on the subject of women equally, I found from my experiences as well that um, for a lot of years um, after my mum and dad divorced, that I put a lot of stock in wishing my dad was around in order to teach me how to be a man but yeah. it wasn't until quite a few years later that I kind of realized that my mum equally has everything that I need in mm. order to kind of help me grow but I just kind of didn't necessarily feel comfortable learning from her because just as a young boy I think naturally you kind of think I'm a boy I need a man to teach me how to be a man mm. so when it came to silly little things like oh, I need to learn how to shave today I remember yeah. thinking, how is my mum going to teach me how to shave my face? Like, you know, <laughs> I've never seen her do it. Like, and, you know, it, it, little things like that kind of get under your skin, those like little falsehoods where it's like, you don't need necessarily need a man to teach you to do that. You don't necessarily need a man to teach you how to open up and be vulnerable. I got all of the skills that I've attributed to me being who I am yeah. today from, from my mum. I, I also do think that, there is, a, there is a need, I think, for some sort of male role model in, in the lives of boys. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dad. Sometimes, uh, I mean, it could be a teacher, it could be like an uncle or brother. Um, and that, I mean, that also goes back to what we talked about in education, where there were so few male teachers. A lot of boys who don't have a, have a dad, they also don't have a, a, any sort of male role model because there's, no, there's so few male teachers that one in five teachers is a man in primary school. So it's like a lot, there is a, a lack of male role models. There are striking correlations between sort of behavioural issues in young boys and, and through, adoles through to adolescence and even with like addiction and homelessness and incarceration. And that, that correlates, there's a strong correlation between that and fatherlessness. And um, I just think it's a difficult problem to solve. There's a lot of reasons behind it. Uh, I think, I mean, we, we, as many role models as possible of every gender, including dads. Um, but unfortunately, dads dads aren't given that that they literally haven't fathers don't even have equal rights so i was like how can we ask dads to be an equal parent if we can't even give them equal rights so um complicated issue and a, yeah. a difficult one and just like what are some of the rights just like off the top like that they they don't fathers. have I think it's interesting for people like who who don't know the kind of scope around like fatherhood yeah. and the issues well, like, they face well like lit literal rights that men don't have well the one i was just talking about being um parental rights yeah. in the UK it's called parental responsibility that's the legal definition of it and parental if you have parental responsibility you just decide what happens you decide everything from the child's name and religion where it goes to school who it lives with you basically you're in, in control of everything and to and parental responsibility is laid out by the children act which is a, a massive 90 it's like 30 years old it sort of sets out who has what and why and uh the, long story short, w women have full parental responsibility of their children in every single circumstance. So whether they're married, single, divorced, separated, they get full parental responsibility. But a dad has to either be married to the mother or named on a birth certificate. And both of those are at the discretion of the mother. And the mother could just deprive a father of rights to his own child. And even if he's got, even if he's got those rights, it doesn't mean he's going to be treated equally in, uh, family courts yeah 
so that's I mean that's that's an example, just yeah. one example of, of a, li- a literal right that men don't have. Yeah, because because I mean it sounds daft almost asking that, but I think you know just even saying male rights to some people is a bit like yeah, you know it's like or like you almost forget like that you know there there are issues like that that you know men face and men don't have because within yeah. the context of people talking about the patriarchy and the patriarchy yeah. being depicted as you know men ruling the world yeah. um you know it, pe- people almost kind of grow into this falsity of assuming that like men are just walking through life easy yeah. and the kind of issues that they face in regards to fatherhood that's on mm. them yeah 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 well, and i mean yeah i'm not i'm not a, i'm not a dad but i i imagine for most parents your child is probably the most important thing in your life. It's more important yeah. than any anything. And to, to lose that is like there's not much worse. There's not many more things worse off, worse than losing a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's just so sad. Um, and I mean patriarchy. The ironic thing about patriarchy is that etym- etymologically that translates to father, patri, archi, ruler, father, ruler, or yeah. ruler fathers is what it really means. And I'm like, how could a father be the ruler if he hasn't even got rights? <laughs> like, yeah. like father, and I'm not just that the way the way we look at fathers in the, in the media, they're always like oafish idiots, like sort of Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin, like they're just like idiots. And then on the other side, you have this like overworked, <clears throat> highly stressed, extremely productive and competent mother. Yeah. And I'm like, and and then the advertising, the uh, even even like the advertising standards authority had to get involved a few years ago because. The, the, the fathers are just being portrayed in advertising as just completely incompetent oafs. There was like an ad that got banned where like, I think a dad was in like a sushi restaurant. He puts his kid down on the conveyor belt and it goes away and he's like, oh, 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 oh. And then they're like banned. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should be banning it, but it's an interesting thing where like we, the, the, our cultural framing of fathers shows them as clowns. And then obviously you go think about how they, they don't have rights and they lose their children in family courts and, I didn't. I didn't see that as a ruler in my eyes. Yeah. Like I, I feel like it's a, di- a very disenfranchised man who's um, disconnected from his family. And, uh... Yeah, and I think as well, it's it's important because with a lot of the work I do as well, because I, because photography and videography work. Um, you know, at times I've looked back at the the kind of like history of how, you know, men have been portrayed and uh, how society likes to depict men, and you you know, you, with women as well, equally over the years. Um, but it's those like little um, advertorial hints and like you know the, these images that you see from boyhood to adulthood. You don't realize that you don't put stock in how much that affects you over time in regard to molding yourself into uh, what you assume a man should be, and um, you know that in itself is. Um, something to be explored and talked about in in regard to you know just how we depict men or have depicted men over time and like you were saying there talking about you know this oafish father um you know i think we as a society don't kind of realize what the impacts are on us and our thought processes when we're kind of met with that kind of like same routine over time um you know it, it, it solidifies itself in your brain without you necessarily even realizing that it's been put there yeah yeah and uh, i mean we we don't seem to be addressing it either mm-hmm. like we, we talk a lot and i'm a big supporter of making working environments more accommodating to women's needs i feel like the work the work the world of work has been developed by men for men even now like 80 percent of board directors are still men and that naturally will lead to working environments that are beneficial to men um, not necessarily through any sort of consciously malevolent action but like uh, men don't really know what it's like to be a woman a woman so when they're designing working right they don't they don't consider it but at the same time think about the home the home life and school life and if and i think about i get a lot of messages about from dads who go to like play groups and stuff with their children and they're treated either as babysitters or pedophiles quite literally there's a story of a man who was pepper sprayed this year uh, for taking a photo of his own ch- kid, <laughs> some some woman went and pepper spray. Actually, he was like, "Fuck off!" Like, <laughs> well, and like this, like we we 
And yeah, that or babysitters where, oh, you're babysitting today. And it's like, no, I am the father. I am just as, I'm a, not a second class parent. And uh, this is my child. I do a lot for them. So you either, either have that or you have the cultural side of it where it's like the advertising where you're seen as like a buffoon or an oaf or whatever else. And then you have the legal side of it where fathers are quite literally deprived of their of their children in, in family. And I keep saying secret family courts, and that's an important word because they are secret. There is very little judicial oversight in family courts because for the protection of children, there's no journalists in there. There's, and there's very little oversight into what's actually going on. All we see coming out are fathers about children. And um, there's a lot of stories of corruption within that system. And um, again, it's not surprising. Do you tend to find that, do you have a specific um, issue within the masculinity that you find more interesting than others? Or do you just enjoy the broad spectrum of issues when you kind of come to curating and exploring the work that you do? I, I try. I just try to talk about how society treats men as a class, and 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 try to work out what are the intersecting factors that link everything together. Like yeah. I post about so many different things: like homelessness, uh, male victims of abuse who are ignored, uh, drug addiction, incarceration, fathers about children. I talk about how like uh, they're, they're they're frequently the ones left behind in disaster zones and. Um, and it all comes down to what I think is just disposability. That men yeah. are seen as more disposable. And it's you hear it all the time. Like I put, I put up a video today on my channel where it was just like the Titanic crashing in 2022. And then one of the, the sailors is like, Captain, do we get the women and children off? And he's like, no, men and children this time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's saying how like in natural disasters, um, it's the women and children that go. And it's like, we, we do that a lot. Like, I know everyone's talking about the Rwanda thing where uh, immigrants from Ukraine are sent to Rwanda and everyone was outraged about it and understandably so, including myself. But then the politicians were coming out being like, don't worry, it is just the male refugees going. And everyone was like, oh, <laughs> Woo, phew. I, I thought it was the women. Like, And um, there's a really great Twitter account called Women and Children where it's like an AI algorithm where it's every time a news article comes out from like a hurricane or some sort of crisis, it finds the women and children and posts that article. And it is a every day that like new articles coming out where it's women and children, women and children. Sometimes it's like like 150 dead, including 20 women and children. And it's like, hold on. So then there's 130 men that have died and they're not even being named and you've just picked yeah. out the women. So there's a lot of stuff like that that I try and shine light on. And allow people to go away and see it for themselves. And uh, male disposability, I feel like. I mean, I'm not going to try and define masculinity for you. I don't know what yeah. it is. I feel yeah. like things. I feel like it's more of a thing that's inside other other stuff. There's like a there's like a style of walking that is masculine. There's a style of dancing that is masculine. There's a style of like everything. Like ev everything has masculine and feminine. I don't necessarily yeah. think it's some inside people. I feel like it certainly exists. Uh, and that's not to say not, no one's just masculine or feminine. People have different different parts of their personality, and they they, they can switch continuously. I know I certainly do. Ah, oh, um, completely. But, but I do also feel like don't want to get too profound about it. But I feel like masculinity sits in a part of our brain that doesn't have access to language. It's such a an ancient part of who we are. It's sort of the very very fundamental part of our human spirit. And that part of our brain, I I I wonder if it even has access to words. Um, in terms of if you actually look at that, that's one of the things I did remember from psychology is that the very center of your brain is like this prehistoric animalistic side, very, very instinctive and emotional. And that doesn't have connection to words or language. So you know when you have a gut feeling something's wrong, but you can't describe it. That's because that part of your brain is just like, this isn't right. I, I can't explain why, because the language sector of my brain is, is sort of part of the more developed side. But yeah. that's why I think masculinity is. It can't be put to words. There are no words for it. It's just a gut feeling, and uh, that's as best as I can do, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's spot on, to be fair. As I say, I, I, it's always just interesting to kind of see as well from different perspectives, because it's, as I say, masculinity is a huge part of what I enjoy talking about and just hearing different perspectives on that, whether people 
do feel that they have a certain masculinity about them, whether or not people just see masculinity as this fluid thing. Um, you know, as I say, we're all inherently unique. We've all kind of, again, so many years through our lives where so many idi idiosyncratic things mold us in a way that we don't quite understand. And it's important to kind of like recognize those differences and be open to hearing different perspectives i suppose yeah 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 and i, I feel it is a, it is a thing it's not entirely socially constructed yeah. it's part of who you are it's in your in your blood and dna and it's not it's neither good nor bad and anyone it doesn't mean men and what masculinity and men are not synonymous with one another uh and and men can be feminine of course and uh yeah because it's, it's again it's quite important in a sense where we talk about this you know masculine energy where I feel as though with women, we can't, we've all, we almost champion women kind of entering into their masculine energy and like utilizing mm. that to get ahead. Whereas yeah. if men try to enter into this feminine energy or kind of utilize these traits that we stereotype as being feminine, um, it can be met with, you know, kind of like frowns or like shame sometimes. It can make you feel a bit like, oh, have I done something wrong? I've tried to utilize something that is maybe inherently stereotypically feminine and yeah. you, you know sometimes you're met with a discomfort around that because yeah. it doesn't seem as fluid as it might be for mm. women mm. Mm. yeah I, I think like there's a lot more work to do in terms of uh exploring the boundaries of masculinity within men and allow, allowing men to move outside of them like everyone talks about the man box which is a series of boxes where men exist where you know, men have to be stoic and heroic and strong and invincible and lacking, like they're not, not emotional. They're, that's the original man box. And yeah. people are being taken out of that man box, thankfully. But I'm wor I am worried about a new man box. Hang on, let me just clo let me close this window for you. Oh, uh, but I am worried that we are now taking men out of the original man box and now we're putting them into a new set of man boxes, which is just you know, male privilege and male violence and patriarchy. And like, we're just, we're just substituting one narrow definition of masculinity for another. And, uh, but at the same, at the same time, like I said, there, there is such a thing as masculinity. You mentioned like, um, I think you mentioned like voices. I think there's a masculine and feminine style of, of like voice. It's interesting where like, uh, my dog, like whenever I speak to her, like in a more words called feminine, I'm like, Myla, come here. She doesn't do it. But if I'm like, come here. She does it straight away, <laughs> and it's, it's it, it, that's borne out as well. In I'm, I'm from I live in London, and uh, in fact, there's been studies on um, voices on intercom systems, and they found that society listens more to a woman's voice. They they listen more to, to what they're saying, but they obey a man's voice more. Which is why in London, if you get on the underground, it's a woman's voice that tells you the information. It's like the next train coming to da -da 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 is going to bank. And then when it when it's the yeah, doors yeah. open, it's like get on the get on the train. <laughs> so it's like it's it's a mixed palette, and um, again, like you can't say too much, but neither are better than than the other. But it's they're just different, uh, but equally valuable. Yeah, and you know, that, as I say, this is partly why I wanted to speak to you. And I know we've kind of covered such a broad range of subjects and topics, but I'm kind of glad mm. we did because I think it's important for people to just kind of get those little snippets of the issues that men yeah. do have. Um, yeah. Cause it's quite, I think I saw one post that you put out where a bit like this conversation, you just kind of like went through a whole list of topics that you have spoken about in the past. and are not going to carry on talking about, but when you're kind of met with this list, it does surprise you because there's, it's all these things that you've maybe never considered or even just seeing them on a page where it's line <laughs> yeah. after line and they're quite yeah. and they're quite poignant um things to think about as well you know it kind of gives it a real gravity of you know the situation the kind of conversations mm. that mm. we need to have and yeah yeah um it'd be interesting just to kind of hear your thoughts on how you see this discussion progressing in the future and maybe what you think certain remedies are in creating more safer and positive discussions around male issues? <sighs> uh, I mean, it's, it's what I hope will happen and what I think will happen. I think I'm, I am yeah. optimistic. When I spoke to Erin, who was my first podcast guest, and she set up the first refuge in the world for women, 
tried to do the same for men and was sort of um, vilified for it and essentially got her life threatened and had to leave the country. She's back now and she's got a very positive outlook on what's going to happen in the next. She's like, she thinks the next five years is going to be a huge turnaround for men. And I do think the same. Like I am, at, I am in a lot of ways at the very centre of this conversation now, at least in social media. And I'm seeing more and more people talking about men in a, in a really positive light. It's like demanding answers uh, and, not, and not in a way of just sort of like platitudes about men can talk and cry, but actually like, let's talk about why there's no refuge for male abuse victims. Let's talk about that. Uh, we need answers. And I feel I'm seeing that coming out of the, the dark corners of the internet and being, and you, being lifted up on, on very, on pretty big channels and, I posted that, posted about that recently, actually, and how how optimistic I am about it. In terms of what I think people should be doing, is um, first of all recognizing that everything I say doesn't detract from the way I feel about women. Like everything, everything you you feel about women, everything uh, you know, reproductive rights and you know, sexual harassment and uh, all these are all things that matter to me too. I'm not saying I don't care about those. I'm just adding to them. Like I I care as much about women's rights as anyone else. I'm just saying as well as this. So I don't want it to be a tit for tat where it's like a tug of war between who gets what. I don't, it has to be an, a both and rather than either or. And also the second thing I want to see happen is to taking men's issues, just to reframing men's issues and not seeing them as entirely internal. Like we internalize men's issues currently. We feel like the solution to men's issues is a, a change of problematic male mindset. And that's where we arrive back at you know, men can cry, men can talk, toxic masculinity, this and that. And it seems to think that men are just self-inflicting these problems onto themselves and, and only they can solve it. Whereas we need to start recognizing that just like everyone else, the, the issues that affect men are systemic. Like um, yeah. in the UK, men get 88% higher prison sentences than women for the same crime. That's like a Home Office report. And uh, I don't understand what, how crying is going to solve that problem. That's, that's something that can only be solved by actual systemic change and on a, at a fundamental level. Like the fathers, they've been crying already. They've still not got their children back. That's not going to be solved. Uh, the refuges that don't exist, there's not one in London for me. There's, not, there's, about, there's, there's, there's virtually no refuges anywhere in the UK or anywhere in the West for men. That's not going to be solved by crying. And we need to, and then the educational crisis, like the boys being behind at every stage of it, like, and there's so many things I could talk to you about, but very few of them are solved through crying or talking. And yeah. that's not to say those things aren't useful, but that's not a complete solution to what men are experiencing. And we need to start acknowledging that. And we need to sort of um, confront the people who are not allowing those conversations to happen. People that are just trying to scale down men's problems, just a problematic male mindset. And to be like, no, no, that's not true. And um, I think we're doing it. I think it's happening. I feel like I, I think... I posted about it recently where um, the diffusion of innovation is a, like, a, a, like a, a sociological law where it tracks how a, a movement takes off. So every single, every, single, every single movement in history has gone over this diffusion of innovation curve. And obviously it starts small, builds at pace, and then ramps up, and then suddenly it becomes viral. And, and the, the tipping point is at 12 to 16%, I think it is. So once you've got that 12, 16% of adoption within a market, suddenly it tips over and then everyone buys into it. And you see it all the time. Every time something kicks off like TikTok or iPhones or like it suddenly it comes out of nowhere. And uh, yeah. I feel like that point, I think, is within the next five years. But uh, yeah. I'm willing to have egg on my face on that one. And uh, I, I mean, I hope <laughs> and it is. And the fact that we're here talking about this, I think yeah. is also a testament to the yeah. fact that these conversations are clearly happening and yeah as i say your um you know instagram account the website that you run the podcast that you do um they're all tremendously fascinating and so well informed and the way you go about presenting the information and making it Thank um uh, approachable is uh it's incredible you know i, I think i well, think it's great thanks very much well, it's just the beginning. Like I said, it's just research and development for what I want to do next, which we are both, it sounds like we're both filmmakers, right? Yeah. And did you say, oh, yeah. great, perfect. Well, I'm building a crew. I, that's what I do. That's my, <laughs> my, my full-time job is not Tin Men. That's a, that's a massive black hole of time and money and emotional labor. 
but my actual job is yeah. as a doc- documentary filmmaker and uh, oh, okay. I, I'd right, love, okay so i'd love to use i'd love to use the skills and and sort of tact and language and network i built through the tin men to create a really meaningful feature length documentary all i want to do is put a camera in front of people and press the red button and see what they say and uh Feel that's a great first step for men to sort of um, get their thoughts and feelings on camera and build a build a documentary around that. But um, I sh- shan't go into too much detail. That's that's for the next five five years or so. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, man, and I appreciate Likewise. you giving up your time. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation. It's great actually seeing the man behind the account. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Having followed it, having followed it for so long, you always have that kind of uh, interest on like who is the person who's like putting all of this Me. stuff together. So <laughs> you, here everyone we are. Thinks it's, everyone thinks it's like a team of people. It's not teams of people. It's just me on my laptop <laughs> in my box of shorts, <laughs> just in front of TV making content. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit secretive. I don't like put a lot of influencers have photos of themselves. Like it's like a post and a photo of themselves and a post and a photo of themselves. No photos of me on my on my page. I like I like to be off camera. Yeah. I tend to stay that way. But yeah, no, it's good to meet you too. Well, it's been a pleasure. I'll let you go. And uh, as I say, I hope you uh, get yourself away on holiday, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll try my best. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> and, uh, I'll watch yeah. you on Instagram. Yeah, definitely, man. It'd be great to keep in touch. Have a lovely day. Yeah. You too. Catch you soon, man. Mm-hmm.